Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Podcast Unflooded. I'm your host, Joe Kendrick, and I am joined by my friend, Alexander Latham, and we are here for a special spooky episode of Podcast Unflooded. We've received some great questions and answers from all of you, and I think it's time to uh, get into it. Alex, do you want to uh, <laughs> you want to introduce yourself and maybe even today's topic? <laughs> Good evening, ghost and ghouls. Today... We have that spooky episode that Joe promised you. Yeah, well, today's topic, if I may, uh, let me, um, today's topic, yeah, it's, it's, we're going to be talking about scary things in video games, scary things we've seen in, in Zelda, especially, but just kind of things that maybe unsettle us or were kind of strange. I, I like the term spooky or creepy because to me, it doesn't imply like fear, but kind of like unnerving things. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and we're going to be starting off with some questions from our community and statements from them as well. Yeah. So we asked we asked the community at large, and by by that I mean all of you, um, for different memorable moments from the Legend of Zelda series that stood out to you as being particularly spooky or dark. And the and the series is full of it. Um, you know, I I recommend anyone who hasn't seen it. There's a there's a video essay called Every Zelda Is the Darkest Zelda, um, that kind of gets into a lot of the dark themes in every game. Um, but I, I guess I want to start with some responses from the YouTube community page. Let me pull that up. True story. Joe did a great community post. Yeah. So here we go. So do you want to just like take turns reading comments? Yeah. Um, and I want to start with uh, Fernando's comment who said, uh, you know, you asked, of course, any spooky moments from Zelda games that stick out to y'all or any questions. And Fernando says, Seeing the ghost ship in the Wind Waker before you even realize there's a Triforce chart in there. Um, ghost ship is pretty spooky. Um, ghostly anything in any game is kind of spooky. Um, but I think ghost ships are, are very interesting because in real life, there's obviously stories of them. And there's something very kind of unsettling, I guess, about the idea of... Uh, it's not even like a, a ghost of a person. It's like a ghost of, a, of an entity or like a group of people even. Um, and I'm, I'm very fascinated... Uh, by them as well. But yeah, I mean, I, I tell me about the ghost ship, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I guess something I like about the way that the Legend of Zelda series handles spooky stuff and ghosts in general is that it's, um, you know, you can't get tired of having ghosts. There's no such thing as too many ghosts because they handle it differently. And I know different people have commented different areas and um, different things that stand out to them as being spooky. And e even areas that are all full of ghosts uh, handle it in different ways. You know, the Wind Waker's Earth Temple is a crypt. You know, it's a, it's a mausoleum, basically, of some kind, a mass grave that you can go through, which is very different from the spooky um, ghost-filled Shadow Temple of Ocarina of Time, you know, which is different from the bottom of the well, which is full of the dead and ghost, which is different from the ghost ship, you know, which is a vessel, like you said, that is this uh, group of entities now on the water, and their ship itself is even you know, pseudo-physical, pseudo-spiritual, you know, beyond our normal realm. And I guess I, I like the Zelda, like, just does so many things with with the undead, and it's it's not just one note, you know, what ghosts and the undead can mean manifest in different ways. And sometimes they're at peace, and sometimes they're very much disturbed, and, and I like that there's both of those. I don't know, I, I'd love to get into a whole discussion on redads with that in mind, but that might be a different video. Yeah, really good points. Yeah, and I want to move on to the uh, this other statement from uh, B Unit. I'm for FM. Uh, I'm sorry, I really butchered that. I should have prepared. My bad, OG. But he said Arbiter's Ground Dungeon's uh, entrance room felt really off-putting. Also, the Death Sword boss in his room before fighting, while well, the mini boss is still sealed. So yeah, Arbiter's Grounds from uh, Twilight Princess in particular, yeah, that's got that scary bone boss at the end. It's supposed to be like a prison for like the worst of the worst in Hyrule. Really cool concept for a dungeon. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. That's one of my favorite dungeons really in the series. Um, I think because of that and because how it handles its undead, right? And it's full of these skeleton warriors and there's a story there, right? And just with, um, I guess I like the, these spooky locations and especially ghosts are um, the way the Zelda handles it, especially in the Arbiter's Grounds. It's, it, it tells you a story. It's like you don't know what this location is, but because you see these ghosts, 
and how the dead can't rest tells you something about the way the this dungeon used to be. You know, and you see them all wearing suits of armor and it kind of tells you something about, okay, were there some kind of gladiator fights here? You know, were these people that died because of this giant bones monster that you fight, you know, at the at the end of the dungeon? Like, it, it tells you a story with all that. Same with the death, uh, the death Sword boss as well. You know, and, it, and you can't fully put it together. But I guess I like that. Like, literally seeing the bones uh, of, of these former um, characters tells you something about the story of, of what used to happen there. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. I'm a big fan of environmental storytelling in games. And I think sometimes it gets a kind of a bad rap because I know there's like a joke about like, oh, all these skeletons conveniently posing right before they die. Um, I, I know that I've seen that circulated, but I do really enjoy it. And it makes a lot of sense within the context of this dungeon. Um, and hundred percent, everything you said, like it kind of just lets you start to think about like, dang, like why were they here? You know, how did this happen? And, and yeah, how does it relate to the boss and, and really interesting stuff. I, I want to take a look at, uh, Norm DeMoss gave us a bunch of answers, which I really appreciate. And he mentions, uh, let me see here. Uh, he does mention Link stabbing a man through the skull in Wind Waker. So spoiler alert for Wind Waker. But at the end, you do stab Dan uh, Ganondorf in the head. And that scene, I mean, Ganondorf in general in Wind Waker really stands out to me as like very unsettling. Like his laugh uh, is kind of creepy. And just the way he he talks there's there's so much to him that I, I find really fascinating and is maybe my favorite version of Ganondorf but yeah I mean you do straight up you know stab him straight in the skull um and he just kind of chuckles and and then dies but it's I think that that whole fight with with Ganondorf even prior to that when you uh fight puppet Ganon you know before you ascend the tower generally just like a really really creepy uh antagonist and I, I I think just Wind Waker really knocked it out of the park with the vibe that we get from that Ganondorf. I totally agree. And and I know a lot of people in discussing Wind Waker and Ganondorf and the story kind of like to like to focus on how much it made Ganondorf empathetic and made him more human. But right, like like you said, like this these final climactic moments of the game show you Phantom Ganon, this ghost of Ganon that you have to fight, show you Puppet Ganon, this giant horrifying marionette monster that transforms again and again um, in, in a really kind of unsettling way um, that I, I love that boss. And, and, you know, we were talking about before the call is just about like how creepy and memorable that boss is and how unexplained it still is. I mean, you know, comment down below your puppet Ganon theories. I love that boss. And then transitioning into the final boss, I guess I like it in this discussion of ghosts and the undead. It's like Ganondorf himself is kind of a relic of an, of an era long gone. Um, I think that that's interesting as well. It's like, I mean, he is kind of this immortal being that you're taking on, but really he's, he's kind of like a, um, he's this, you know, he's kind of a skeleton that you have to once again, let die with the world that is also buried. Um, and I, I think there is some interesting symbolism there, um, in leaving it under the ground as you rise up to the surface. Yeah. How true and real, Joe? Um, I gotta say, no, very good point. I like that you mentioned Ganondorf's uh, empathy in Wind Waker because that is something that I think makes that character really unique is sort of his relationship with the Hylians and the King of Hyrule and that that past and, you know, how he feels very close to the Gerudo uh, people in that one as well. Um, but with that being said, he still is very, like, intimidating and kind of scary in that game. And I do think there is something kind of metal and and kind of freaky about, yeah, the way you defeat him, it ends with you just stabbing him straight through through the skull. Um, you know, it doesn't pit disappear in like a cloud of smoke or whatever, like so many enemies. It's just it's it's just a very real fight. Feels like a real duel. And uh I think it's a phenomenal piece of uh of kind of just creepiness in, in Wind Waker and Zelda in general. Um are there any other Zelda moments that you want to talk about that are kind of creepy or unsell you, either from the YouTube comments or from uh, your own personal feelings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, there's so much in so many games, and especially, like, I don't want to get too much into Tears of the Kingdom discussion yet, but I'm very excited to have more discussions on that game 
And I mean, just to, especially with the with the literal darkness of that game. But I think that's a different discussion for another game for another day. Um, it may be time to open up the discussion more to just I think spookiness in games in general and just kind of opening it up beyond the Zelda series and just kind of reflecting on that. Alex, do you want to kind of start that discussion? Yeah, like for me personally, I don't know if there's been a lot of games from when I was younger that like really scared me to where like I didn't want to play them. But there was a lot of stuff that was sort of uh, back to like what we originally talked about, like creepy and unsettling. Um, and I think probably my earliest like memory with that was uh, Super Mario 64. And maybe it was just because when I played it, like I didn't play it when it first came out. I played it in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. So I kind of had other games to judge it by, right? I had games that looked better and, and could do more on screen. But Mario 64, particularly in its castle uh, hub, but also just in its levels, can feel very like empty and strange and these little like ships in a bottle almost. Um, I think there's something about kind of wandering the, the halls of the castle and opening doors and not really knowing what you'll find. And then, you know, occasionally you hear that Bowser laugh that, oh, or 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 that it just kind of gets you. Um and and we talked earlier off call or on a call that was not this call that uh you mentioned how it kind of feels dreamlike. Um and I think that's like a really great way to encapsulate it. Um it it almost feels like a, a dream. There are things that are just a little bit off, whether it's purposeful design decisions or it is just kind of like, oh, um, like we don't have the power to have the toads standing uh, fully visible all the time. So they kind of fade in and out as you move around, like stuff like that just kind of adds up and makes it kind of spooky. If I may. I think that's a great example. I, I love that ship in a bottle, uh, phrase that you use. Cause that's exactly how it feels like, cause you're, you're not in, um, you're not being transported really to worlds. You're being transported to paintings. And I think that that like difference really makes it like, you're not, you're never in a real world. You're kind of always within someone's imagination and you can never fully explore it, you know, and you're not even sure whether, and, and that could be a debate, right? Like, do you think Bob on Battlefield is a place the painting takes you to? Or is it all a world within a painting? You decide, comment down below. But I, I love that example because I, I think even at the time, compared to other N64 games, it feels dreamlike, even compared to games with the exact same technical limitations like Ocarina of Time, which to me, like it, it feels like a real world in a very different way, even though they're both very limited um, in technical ways. Yeah, I, I really do think Mario 64 was like my first introduction to a game that felt kind of unsettling in a way that didn't turn me off from the experience, but it did. Uh, it was strange. And, you know, I could talk about maybe I will about like, you know, certain locations like I always felt kind of dire, dire docks was always kind of a strange place. And maybe it was the music. And then, of course, there's wet, dry world that has that strange, you know, uh, JPEG or whatever of a, like this weird underwater town in the background. And then obviously you can find the underwater town. And it's just like, what is going on here? Like there's stuff about, you know, the layout of the town and the level that doesn't really feel like a real place like bomb bomb battlefield. Like, yeah, it's a valley you know, with a mountain in it and, you know, dire, dire docks is like, well, there's a beach and then there's like a little underwater, you know, ship and all that. And that makes sense. But like, especially wet, dry world, it just, it doesn't feel like it's a real location. Um, and that's not like a, a negative thing, like a dig to it. I think it makes the location stand out and is really unique, but it just does feel really dreamlike. And I think, yeah, Mario 64, I think was my, my first, uh, experience with that sensation in gaming yeah no i think that's a great example yeah for for all the points that you mentioned i guess i'd love to talk about like kind of spooky elements as well in in games and you know not just things that are unsettling but literally halloweeny you know we talked before about um pac-man world 2 which has halloween levels as its uh finale and you know and that's a game we grew up grew up with and i i think that it's um because it's it's blatantly spooky i mean the villain is spooky <laughs> his name is literally spooky is the thing um and can we bring him back can we get spooky in smash folks let's get that hashtag trending i know they're not adding any more smash characters but can we do something please i miss him so much actually i love his design um 
yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to go bounce off. I want to, um, what do they call it in Pac-Man? Butt bounces or whatever. I want to, I want to bounce off what you said, but doing, um, cause yeah, Pac-Man has like a really, Pac-Man World 2 is like, you start in that kind of grassy field and you're like, Ooh, you know we're having fun it's chill and then you know you go to Bedoin woods and that's a interesting setting too because it's uh you know the music kind of changes and it, it feels like that's where the games i think when it really starts to pick up the challenge like is in the wooded section um right before you fight i believe it's inky the blue ghost but then there's just that whole ghost island which is really a unique set of, of levels and i'd love to hear you i feel like you have a lot to say about this so i'll pass the mic over to you well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, let's say, um, I, I think what's so interesting ab about that section um, is that, like, for the rest of the game, it's a, similar to Super Mario 64, right, is that these disconnected parts of the world are biome-focused. You know, Pac-Man World 2 takes you through, you know, the fields, the canyon, and then the, the forest, you know, the woods um, in, in different ways. And then it takes you up the snowy mountain, into the volcano, in, under the ocean, but then, you know, it ends not with another biome, but with this Halloween-themed world that is, of course, focused on ghosts and spooky because Pac-Man is all about eating the ghosts. Um, so, so I think it's totally fitting, but it also stands out because it's the only one that's not uh, tied somehow with a natural theme, while the rest of the game is very much about, you know, Pac-Man in a natural space, which I think is interesting. It's like there's not much civilization. I don't, I don't think there's any civilization in the game besides um pack village and i guess whatever the, the spooky village i don't know if there's a there's a name there um to that to that village but but i think that that's kind of it um maybe i don't know maybe it's even meant to be a transformed version of of pack village who's to say but no i i think that it's it's a it's a really atmospheric game and it's it's not compared to super mario 64 i think there's a lot of comparisons between pac-man world 2 and super mario 64 but Pac-Man World 2 didn't have to deal with the same technical limitations. So its atmosphere feels a lot more intentional. Yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that kind of that Pac Village is sort of the sole bastion of civilization in that world. Cause because yeah, I, I I hadn't thought of it, but when you put it in the words, I'm just like, yeah, like it is kind of Pac Village is very small and compact, and there's really like there's like the professor, and then there's like um the construction guy like in front of the museum was like oh you need the tokens pal if you want to get in here like it's you don't i don't you don't even see your your wife and kid you know um it is it feels there's some strangeness to it and as you travel through yeah like you don't really ever see it's just you always are fighting kind of ghost and, and beast um so it, it has a kind of strange feeling to it um and yeah i mean it it, it is quite unique i'm glad you said that um, and, and the ghost island that you go to is, is really interesting because they, they just kind of, they get crazy with the level design. I know there's a part where you are in this sort of maze in this swamp and it's, um, you know, you, you actually have to kind of pay attention to where you're going because I remember getting lost as a kid there. And there's just this sort of, you never encountered a level like that before. I mean, you had like little mini game mazes, like the very first Pac-Man game, but this is where you're actually like in a 3D level where it's like, oh God, like I got to pay attention to where I'm going. I'm not just going left to right or back to forward. Um, and they kind of mess around with you in that game a bit near the end. That, there's a big, uh, I think that game had some pretty big like uh, upticks in difficulty. Like I think the, I feel like I, str I mean, I don't know about you, man, but I struggled on that last ghost boss fight. I believe it was Clyde, the red ghost. It took me like a hundred tries to beat him. Um, and it took me a really long time to get through the ice levels, too. I, I struggled. And that last ghost island, they just throw everything at you. I totally agree. The um, the boss fight for the the snow mountain, uh, I remember thinking that was really hard. I haven't replayed the game in maybe a year or two. I remember even the last time I played it, like as an adult, struggling with some of those boss fights. Um, I don't think I beat the game then when I replayed it. I don't think I've beaten the game since I was like in high school. Uh, just because there is that uptick in difficulty and the uh, the volcano stages... Even the platforming there, I'm sorry, man. It's, it's still a hard game. I mean, you know, I'm sorry that I can't beat beat the kids' game. I'm trying. <laughs> but... No, it's tough. I mean, they were trying to go back to the old days of arcades where they made them very, very difficult, so you would keep putting quarters in. And they forgot that Pac-Man World Two was a one-time purchase. No, 
No microtransactions for that one. Um, but yeah. And I guess if we have the time, I do want to talk about like Shadow of the Colossus because I know I've played that game like to completion. I know you've played like a few hours of it. And that's another game where the world just feels very strange and unsettling. And I think it's because, I mean, I guess for context, for people who don't know, which is probably important, maybe we should have been <laughs> adding that into some people. Um, but yeah, you go to this kind of these like for forbidden lands, basically, and you fight these giant colossus and they're at different points in the map and you got to fight them in order. But uh, what's really kind of creepy about it is the world feels very empty. I mean, there, there's nature and such, but um besides you and these giant colossi you don't really inter encounter any other wildlife like there's lizards and like the occasional hawk or eagle flying through but it's a very empty game and, and playing through it there is always that sense of like you feel very lonely but you also just feel you know you can't help but like as you traverse through the world trying to find your next colossi i don't know you, you feel uncomfortable maybe it's because you feel like you're being watched and i think it's also because um you kind of know that uh, some men from your village are like pursuing you as well. And there's this sort of almost, there's not really a timer in the game, but there's that kind of sense of urgency that you got to kill these colossi before, you know, things get worse. And it's a really unique experience that I think I, I would classify it as an open world game. Um, maybe one of the first, I don't know, but it's one of the first I played and it's got a feeling that no other open world game has replicated for me. I think that's a great example, and I, I I like what you bring up. I think a big part of the atmosphere comes, I guess, from the visual atmosphere, from the map, from the environment. And uh, I know we talked before the call about, like, does the remake capture that, you know, and can you even compromise the atmosphere by increasing the fidelity too much in the in a different direction? And, you know, I, I think that's, that's something you run into with remakes. And, you know, I know a lot of the Zelda games now are getting remakes that go in slightly different directions. Um aesthetically and that you know, i think was especially with ocarina of time 3d and wind waker hd those are remakes that um i think challenge the aesthetics of the original experience a little bit yeah i think that is definitely like a pretty important like conversation to be had and i don't know if it's for this uh you know episode but i i, I think ultimately the remaster does really still capture that feeling and i think a, a long what goes a long way is I think they really nail the, the lighting and colors still. Um, but also there is just like a lot more uh, foliage and, and growth and, and things like that. And that was present in the original game. But in the original game, there was a lot of sections that were very much like wastelands, very rocky and sandy and just kind of these blasted out areas that didn't really support much uh, life. And, you know, something that would sometimes contrast that is like these big open wastelands is where you'd fight a lot of these glossi and when you would beat them you could go back and see their like corpse and see uh like plants growing out of it and stuff and kind of almost you know the theories would run wild is like were these colossi did they suck up the life around them to be born because they have features that are both um look like architectural but also they've got like you know biological features whether it's like animal or or plant and the whole game is just really brimming with atmosphere that is sort of creepy and unsettling and makes you maybe nervous when you when you play it and you're wandering through i totally agree i think that's that's a great example of atmosphere in games i'd love to keep um doing more discussions of i guess how do you create atmospheres in these in different games you know not just spooky atmospheres and unsettling atmospheres but you know, how, how does all the, the mise-en-scene, you know, contribute to a feeling? But that may be a discussion for another episode. I think it's about time to wrap up. I think that's about all the time we have for today. Alex, you have any closing thoughts? No closing thoughts. Thank you for joining in on this spooky episode. <laughs> Had a lot of fun talking about it. Um, and I would love to keep the conversation going in the comment section down below. Like, what are some things from when you were a kid or even now, even a game recently you experienced that was like, whether it was scary or creepy or just kind of a bit odd, let us know. Let us know. Comment down below any of you, um, any of your thoughts on that or any questions that you have that you want us to answer in future episodes about anything or if you want to hear our thoughts or just, just have questions. Let us know. Let us know what you want us to discuss next. 
And remember, folks, peace and love from us to y'all.